If GED science is holding you back from moving ahead to a better job or college or military service, whatever your goal happens to be, then know that in this video, I'm going to teach you tips, tricks, and strategies and walk you through some GED science practice questions to help you move ahead faster. As part of an experiment, Arthur collected volumetric bone density, mass per unit volume, for four samples. He needs to figure out the bone de mean bone density for the four samples. Arthur knows that the formula for density is as follows. Density equals mass divided by volume. What is the mean bone density for the four given data samples? You may use your calculator. So we don't have multiple choice answers for this question. So just come up with your own answer here. I don't care how you round it. Just try to get an answer close to mine. And the bone density data is shown below. So now's your chance to pause the video, try to figure this out. And then as always, when Every you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so what we have to do here to start, for each sample, we have to calculate the density. And the formula tells us that density is mass over volume. So let me start by calculating the density for sample A. So to do that, I take the mass of sample A, which is 8.1, and I'm gonna take the volume of sample A, which is 28.3, okay. 28.3, and it's easy enough to just plug this in the calculator. So when I do 8.1 divided by 28.3, I get about 0.286, and then a bunch of other numbers, but I'm just gonna leave that as 0.286, okay? So if you repeat that process for sample B, C, and D, you should get these values, maybe a little different depending on how you round, but it shouldn't be much different. You should get 0 0.675, 0 0.655, and 0.565. All right, and again, all you're doing is taking the mass and dividing by the volume. So for B here to get that 0 0.675, you would have had to have done 16.2 divided by 24. Okay, so hopefully that's clear. I just put these here to save time rather than showing the calculation again for B, C, and D. Um, you just repeat the process I applied in A, and you should get these values here, or something very close. Now, we're not just asked to find the uh, densities for the four samples. What we have to do is we have to find the mean bone density for the samples. In other words, we have to find the average. So how do we find the average? Well, we find the average by adding up each of the densities here, and then we're going to divide by four. Now, ask yourself, why are we going to divide by four? Well, we're dividing by four because we've got four different samples here, all right? If it was five, then we would divide by five, all right? So we just count up the fact that we've got four different densities here. We've got four samples, and that's why we're dividing by four. Okay, hopefully that's clear. So when you do mean calculations, all you do is you add up all the numbers in your data set and you count up the total number of numbers in your data set and that's what you divide by. So here we've got one, two, three, four different values. So we add those four values up and we divide by four. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so if you add these all up and divide by four, you should get 0.545 as your answer. All right, or something very close, maybe if you round it a little bit differently. Okay, but this is the answer that you should have gotten or something very close to it. So our graph over here shows solubility versus temperature for a variety of salts. Solubility is here on the vertical axis. Temperature in Celsius is down here on the horizontal axis. And you've got your key up here that tells you which colors correspond to which substance. And here it says, which of the following is false? At 80 degrees Celsius, Na2HASO4 has the highest solubility. B, the solubility of NaCl increases as temperature increases. C, from 40 degrees Celsius to 100 degrees Celsius, the solubility of Na2SO4 increases. Or D, none of the above. All right, and so for those watching this on a cell phone or if maybe you're watching this on a tablet with a smaller screen, I tried to make this graph as big as possible. Um, so hopefully this is clear, but now's your chance to pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. 
Okay, so probably the best way to approach a question like this is to just look at each answer choice and use process of elimination. So at 80 degrees C, Na2HaSO4 has the highest solubility. So over here we see solubility and Na2HaSO4 is in red. So basically this red line right here, let's check at 80 degrees. So down here we see that on our temperature, right, here's 80 degrees. So this line right here that I'm tracing, all right, this is going to show us uh, what's happening with solubility at 80 degrees. So basically, at 80 degrees, we see that red, all right, has the highest solubility because the red line, which represents Na2HaSO4, all right, if we trace over here it looks like the solubility would be between 80 and 90 which is by far the highest so this is a true statement so we're going to rule this out because we're looking for which of the following is false so b the solubility of nacl increases as temperature increases so let's find nacl in this case it's the pink line so this pink line right here and a good way to think about this is imagine that we have a little stick figure starting at the leftmost part of the line. And if the stick figure were to just follow this line, just going from left to right, okay, what we're going to see is a is a little increase. All right, so if you look at this pink line, there's just there's an increase going from left to right. It's not a dramatic increase, but it is increasing going left to right. The person would be going just a little bit uphill slightly, all right, as we go from left to right. So that would tell us that as temperature increases, solubility is also increasing. So this is a true statement. So we can take B out because we want to find which of the following is false. Now let's think about C. From 40 degrees C to 100 degrees C, the solubility of Na2SO4 increases. So in this case, we only have to check between the temperatures of 40 and 100. So right here, this represents 40. And right here, we've got 100. All right, so we just, for, for this answer choice, we just need to focus on what's happening in between these two lines. So everything over here on the graph is not relevant to the question. We just need to look between 40 and 100. And we want to see what's happening with the Na2SO4. So Na2SO4 right here is the blue line. So this darker blue line, I should say, the darker blue line looks like if we, again, we just imagine we've got a stick figure and the person is going to walk, follow that line going from left to right, we would see that they would be going down a hill. All right. So basically, we can see that from 40 to 100 degrees, the solubility is not, is not increasing, it's actually decreasing, right? Because it starts out maybe somewhere close to 50 and at 40 degrees, then by 100 degrees, it's down here closer to 40 solubility, okay? So C is going to be the false statement here. So C is the correct answer. And if you had trouble with this, um, I have a video on reading graphs in science uh, that might be helpful to watch and then maybe come back and try this one again. Um, this is really a lot of graph reading skills to answer this question. Which salt below displays solubility that is inversely proportional to temperature? Now, it's always a challenge trying to fit everything up on the screen, and this was the best way I could come up with to do it. So hopefully you can see this clearly if you're on a cell phone or a small screen device. But now is your chance to pause the video, and it doesn't matter if you get this right or wrong for right now. It's all about the learning, so give it a shot. And if you get stuck, don't worry, because we're just going to go over the answer. Okay, so let's talk about this question here. So first of all, what does inversely proportional really mean? Because if you weren't sure what that meant, then... Uh, you probably had trouble with this question, which is understandable. So inversely proportional basically would mean that if the temperature increases, the solubility is going to decrease, okay, or vice versa. So if temperature decreases, solubility is going to increase, okay. So this is what we mean by inversely proportional. Now that's in contrast to directly proportional. Okay, so directly proportional, that would be temperature increases and so does solubility. Okay, 
So if you increase the solubility, the temp would go up and vice versa, all right? So, or if you decrease the temperature, the solubility is also going to go down because that would be directly proportional. And so what we're going to look at and see here is, are any of these salts, okay, do they display an inverse proportionality? In other words, which salt below displays solubility that's inversely proportional to temperature? So let's check A, B, and C, and if none of them display that relationship, then D will be the answer. So let's look at A first. This Na2HASO4, which is this red line here. So again, let's use a stick figure here. And if you can just think through this without the stick figure, then you're probably wondering why I'm wasting time showing a stick figure, but I think it's helpful just to kind of understand what's happening. So I'm just tracing this red line here to make it easier to see. So imagine that the stick figure is going to start at the leftmost portion, and if the stick figure just follows this line, we can see that the entire time the person would be going up a hill. Okay, and so right, that basically means that the whole entire time, right, so temperature increases here as we go from left to right, and solubility also increases as we go from down to up. So if the person is going up the hill the entire time, that means that temperature, that as temperature increases, solubility also increases. So for Na2HASO4, all right, that is actually going to be a directly proportional relationship. So let's take A out because A is not uh, inversely proportional. Again, we see we've got a straight line. We've got a line that's going here. The line is just going up the whole time. That tells us that as temperature increases, solubility also increases. Okay, so let's take that one out. So what about NaCl? Well, NaCl is this pink line right here. So if we imagine there's a little stick figure that's going to walk this line here, we would see that it's it's very subtle, right? It's not as gradual of an increase as the red line, but we do see that the pink line there's, it's going to increase slowly and steadily, all right, as temperature increases. So basically for the pink line here, it is going up the entire time, just a lot. Uh, it's a lot more of a slow and gradual climb versus the red line. But this is also going to be directly proportional because as temperature increases, so does solubility for NaCl. So let's take that out. That's, inver that's not inversely proportional. So what about C? So for the BANO32, that's this green line right here. And so actually this green line, it's just like really very similar to the last two cases. The entire time it's just increasing, okay? The entire time it's just going straight up the entire time. So that means that as temperature increases, so does solubility. Okay, so this is going to not be right, uh, and D is going to be the correct answer. All right, so you might be wondering... What would a line look like that is inversely proportional in this case? So maybe if we had a line that looked like this, okay, that was going downhill like this, right? So imagine if we started a stick figure at the top here, and if the person followed that line and it was going down like this, that would tell us that, hey, as temperature increases, solubility is decreasing. So this would be a case where uh, the the salt would display solubility that's inversely proportional to temperature. Okay, but out of these choices here, A, B, and C, none of them display an inversely proportional relationship. Uh, so D is the correct answer here. All right, so this is a little bit confusing. It's a little bit complicated here. Um, but hopefully you get the basic idea here. Hopefully this makes sense. And really this just goes back to understanding the basic skills as far as how to read graphs and just understanding what we mean by inversely proportional and directly proportional. So this first champion shout out goes to Brooke who says, I have a baby girl and I have a hard time studying. I just officially passed and she passed everything on her first try except math, which she passed on her second try. So I want to wish Brooke congratulations and wish her well with whatever's coming next for her. 
And also I want to give a champion shout out to another GED test taker who says, the reason as to why I want to get my GED is because I'm trying to show my kids that you're never too old to learn and you can do it if you put your mind to it. And I'm going to show my kids never to give up. If I can do it, they can. And I also want to get a good career, go to college. This way I can secure a good future for my family. And I think this comment here just really sums up what Test Probe Champions is all about here. The melting point is the temperature at which a solid becomes a liquid. The boiling point is the temperature at which a liquid becomes a gas. If lithium has a melting point of 357 degrees Fahrenheit and a boiling point of 2448 degrees Fahrenheit, which of the following is true? A. At 70 degrees Fahrenheit, lithium is a liquid. B. At 2449 degrees Fahrenheit, lithium is a liquid. C. At 2,449 degrees Fahrenheit, lithium is a gas, or D. None of the above. So let me give you a chance to pause the video if you'd like to and, and try this out. Take all the time that you need, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. And don't worry if you get it right or wrong, or if you get stuck. We just care about the learning right now. Okay, so let's look at this. So the concept here to understand is solids, liquids, and gases the three states of matter. So basically, think about a candy bar, right? Say you have a chocolate bar, and if you leave it in a hot car or somewhere like that, it's going to melt, all right? And when a solid becomes a liquid, we call that melting. And when a liquid becomes a gas, we call that boiling. A common example of boiling would be if you are cooking something on the stove and you turn the water on to boil, all right, that is an example of a liquid becoming a gas. And right here for lithium, we're told that lithium is going to melt at 357 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm just going to write 357. And it's going to boil at 2,448 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when lithium will become a gas. So let's go one by one uh, and check each answer choice to see which one is true. At 70 degrees Fahrenheit, lithium is a liquid. Well, let's see if this is 357 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, at 70 degrees, lithium is going to be a solid. All right, so at 70 degrees, lithium is not going to be a liquid. Lithium has to reach 357 in order to melt and become a liquid. So that's why we're taking A out. All right, so 70 degrees is... I don't know, way down here somewhere, and not hot enough for lithium to become a liquid. Let's look at B. At 2,449 degrees Fahrenheit, lithium is a liquid. So 2,449 degrees Fahrenheit is hotter than the boiling point, right? It's hotter than 2,448 degrees, all right? So we know that at 2,448 degrees at the boiling point, we know that lithium is going to boil. It's going to become a gas. So it's not going to be a liquid at a temperature higher than 2,448 degrees. So any temperature above 2,448 degrees, lithium is going to be a gas because it's going to boil at that boiling point. So what about C? 2,449 degrees Fahrenheit, lithium is a gas because it boils at 2,448 degrees it becomes a gas at 2,448 degrees. 2,449 degrees is higher than 2,448 degrees, so lithium will be a gas. What app or website completely changed your life? YouTube. Are you a planner or more of a go with whatever happens when it comes to travel? I'm definitely a planner. What's something you believe you'll never be able to do well? Probably audio and video quality here on YouTube. My camera is like way outdated and my audio tends to not be the best, but hey, people still watch my videos and I'm grateful for that. I like N64, PS1, PS2, things of that nature, like the old Silent Hill Resident Evil games and also Zelda games. When are you most productive? I tend to be more of a night owl naturally. My opinion on social media is that I would rather not have it. I kind of miss the way things were before we had it, but it's not going anywhere, so we might as well embrace it. Researchers are studying the dietary habits of Bicropterus salmoides, more commonly known as the largemouth bass, at different sizes. The table below summarizes the food source or sources bass of different length consumed in a pond. 
So here we've got a little table. It says length of bass in millimeters, 25 to 75, 100 to 225, 250 to 300, and also above 300. Now over here it says food source, and it lists insects, shrimp, small fish and insects, shrimp and crayfish, crayfish and large fish over here. And it says, which of the following did the researchers observe during the study based on the results above? A, bass greater than 300 millimeters feeding on insects. B, bass between 25 to 75 millimeters feeding on large shrimp. C, bass between 250 to 300 millimeters feeding on shrimp. Or D, none of the above. So now's your chance to try this question. You could pause the video, give it a shot, and when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so... As with many questions, I think it's helpful to just go one by one here and just eliminate answers that are not uh, going to work. So which did they observe? Bass greater than 300 millimeters feeding on insects. So if we look right here where it says above, bass above 300 millimeters, and it tells us that the food source of bass above 300 millimeters was crayfish and large fish. Some people say crawfish. Bass greater than 300 millimeters feeding on insects. Let me take that out here. Um, because we, we don't see insects listed here. Bass between 25 to 75 millimeters feeding on large fish. So let's go check that. We've got 25 to 75 range. The food source for those bass was insects. That's what the researchers observed them feeding on, so we take that out as well. C, bass between 250 to 300 millimeters feeding on shrimp. So we find that category, 250 to 300 the food source for that was observed for the bass in this range was shrimp and crayfish. So C is correct because they are feeding on shrimp in this range. And also the crayfish, crawfish, however you want to say it. Um, so C is the correct answer here. And whenever you're ready, we'll move on to the next question. The data in the table below represents the highest daily temperatures in Championsburg measured over a six day period. So we see we've got days one through six and we've got temperatures listed for each day in degrees Celsius. Now we see this formula right here and the question says, what was the median temperature over the six day period measured in degrees Fahrenheit? You may use your calculator. And note that degrees Fahrenheit is bolded. And the multiple choice answers are right here, A, B, C, and D. This was just how I could fit everything on the screen was to put the multiple choice answers right here. So now let me turn it over to you to pause the video, take all the time you need with this question here, and whenever you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so let's talk about this question. So we have to figure out the median temperature. So what is the median? Well, the median is the middle number. Once you've put all of the numbers in order from smallest to largest. And so that's the part that students oftentimes forget. They will remember median has something to do with the middle number, which is correct, but that's not the whole story. All right. So in order to correctly get a median question right, which you're going to do on your test, because hopefully you're going to remember this, you need to take the numbers and put them in order from smallest to largest first. Okay, and, and that's something that a lot of people forget. Actually, that's one when I did a lot of in-person tutoring, a lot of people would forget to do that. And that's one of the most common mistakes I'd see people make. So to get the median, put the numbers in order from smallest to largest first, which I've done here. We've got 24, 25, 26, 27, 27, 28. I read that very quickly for the sake of time. Now, we've got six different temperatures here. So when we have an odd number of numbers, you can just pick the number right in the middle after you've ordered them from smallest to largest, and it's really easy to get the median. But we've got to do another step here because in this case, we have an even number of numbers, all right? So we've got six numbers here. We've got one, two, three, four, five and six in the middle here. So we take the two middle numbers, and we are going to add these up and divide by two. Okay, so let's add these up and divide by two. So again, for the median, you take the numbers, order them from smallest to largest. If you've got an even number of numbers, you take the two numbers in the middle, add them up and divide by two. If you have an odd number of numbers, you just pick the one right in the middle and it's pretty easy. Okay, so the answer to this step, and remember, this is just a step, we're not done, is 26.5. 
Okay, so if you got this far and you thought that A was the right answer, give yourself a pat on the back because you did a really, really good thing. You, you calculated the median correctly for this part of the question. So you did a really, really good job. I, I'm sure someone watching this, maybe you got to this step and you thought A was the right answer. So just know that there's one more step here, right? Because we have to convert this into degrees Fahrenheit. All right, so this is the median in degrees Celsius. We're gonna to have to use this formula and convert it into degrees Fahrenheit, all right? So if you got that far, know that you were on the right track, you were super close, you just had to do an extra step here, which I'll show you how to use this formula first. And then I'll show you how to do it. Um, I'll give you like a little quick tip to do it too. Um, it, but you have to memorize something to use the quick tip. So it's up to you to decide if that's going to be worth it or not. Um, okay, so this is 9 over 5. This dot means times 26.5, all right, plus 32. This dot almost looks like a decimal here. So in my calculator, I'm going to do 9 over 5 times 26.5, and I'm going to add 32. And when I do that, I get 79.7, .7, which is the correct answer here. So let me give you two quick tricks that you can use for temperature conversions. The only thing is you're going to have to memorize these if you want to use these tricks. So it's up to you to decide if you want to memorize these or not. But basically, the quick way to convert degrees Celsius to degrees Fahrenheit is you multiply the temperature in degrees Celsius by 1.8 and add 32. And to go from Fahrenheit to Celsius, you take the degrees Fahrenheit, subtract 32 from it, then divide by 1.8. Tommy, I was gonna let you teach the next question, but it looks like all you wanna do is play video games, so I should probably just do the next question. So in this question here, we see a table with different elements and also boiling points. And the question says, what is the range of the boiling points for the elements included in the chart measured in degrees Fahrenheit? Is the answer A, B, C, or D? So now is your chance to pause the video, try to figure this out, and you can use a calculator for this question and also for the entire test. So why don't you try this out, take all the time you need, and if you get stuck, don't worry because we'll just go over the answer. Okay, hopefully you had a chance to pause the video and try this question. So to find the range, all we have to do is take the biggest number in the data set and subtract the smallest number. So the biggest number is 8,700, the smallest number is negative 4, 52.1. Now, when you subtract a negative, that's really the same as plus, but we can also just plug this in our calculator and easy enough, we'll see that the answer here is C. So to recap, to find the range, you take the biggest number and the smallest number, and you are going to subtract them, and that's all you have to do to find the range. Which of the following statements is supported by the data in the chart? A. Carbon is a gas at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. B. Helium is a gas at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. C. The boiling point of copper is higher than the boiling point of titanium. Or D. None of the above. So now is your chance to pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so remember, we have three stages of matter. Solids, liquids and gases. Some people call these the three phases of matter. Some people say three stages of matter. Um, so anyway, we're talking about the same thing, which every word you want to use here, but we've got solids, liquids, and gases, and boiling is when a liquid becomes a gas. And so carbon's boiling point is 8,700. So in other words, carbon becomes a gas at 8,700 degrees. Now, if we have carbon stored at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is roughly room temperature, that is so far below the boiling point uh, that there's no way carbon is gonna be a gas at that temperature. Carbon has to reach 8,700 degrees Fahrenheit to boil. At 70 degrees Fahrenheit, carbon will not be a gas, so we can take this out. Now, B, helium is a gas at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Well. Here we see that helium's boiling point is negative 452.1 degrees. So if helium gets to negative 452.1 degrees, it's going to become a gas. And 70 degrees is higher than negative 452.1. So actually, this is going to be our true statement right here. Helium's going to boil at negative 452.1. 70 degrees is well above negative 452.1. So uh, helium will be a gas if stored 
at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can just think of a balloon, for example. Balloons have helium in them, and that is a gas. Now it's time for this video's Champions Challenge question. So if you're ready for a challenge, this is the hardest question in the video in my opinion, so I'll let you try that right now. Balance the following chemical equation. And in this case, we don't have multiple choice answers. This is just for you to come up with the answer on your own. So now's your chance to pause the video, try to figure this out, and then when you're ready, we'll go over the answer. Okay, so first of all, note that Everything on to the left of our arrow here, in other words, everything on the left-hand side of the equation, all right, these are called the reactants. And on the other hand, everything on the right-hand side of our equation, in other words, everything to the right of this arrow, these are called the products. Now, also note that if I had two arrows, for example, if I had this arrow going in this direction and another arrow going in this direction, that would signify that this is a reversible reaction. But in this case, we don't see that, so we don't have to worry about it here. Okay, and also note that when we balance these little numbers here, you don't change these numbers. You can't change the little numbers. You can only change the numbers out front. And here, we don't see any numbers out front, so we just assume that there's a 1 in front of each of the substances, but we don't write it. Okay, so... If you can do this in your head, it's probably going to save you some time on your test, but for the purposes of explaining this right now, and also this is a good way to do it on your test too, there's nothing wrong with writing it out this way, it just might take a little bit longer, but if you get the right answer, then I guess it was time well spent. All right, this LHS stands for left-hand side, so everything over here, let me say RHS, this stands for the right-hand side, okay? So what I'm going to do to start is I wanna take stock of what I have on both sides of the equation. And right now I'm going slow to explain this just to facilitate understanding. But really, after you've done a couple examples of this, hopefully you'll be able to do it faster. So know that it doesn't usually take this long on the test. I'm just breaking it down slowly for educational purposes. So how many CAs do I have on the left-hand side of my equation? I have one, right? In this first substance, this CaOH2. Now, how many O's do I have? Well, I've got, in this case, I've got two, I've got parenthesis OH and this little two out here. So from the CaOH2, I have to consider this two oxygens, okay? And the same with this H here. I've got this little two out here, so I've got to consider this as two H's, okay? So now let's take stock of what we have in the H3PO4. So I've got an H with this little three beside it. So that means that I have three hydrogens from the H3PO4. Okay, so I'm going to add two from the hydrogens in the CaOH2. Okay, so what about the P's? I've got one P and I also have four O's, right? For H3PO4. This little four here means I've got to add four O's. All right, so the final count here, I have one CA, I've got six O's, and I've got five H's all on my left-hand side, and also one P. So let me now do the same with the elements on the right-hand side. So how many CA's do I have on the right-hand side? Well, if I look right here, I see that I have three. So let me make a note of that right here. Now, I've got parenthesis PO4 parenthesis 2. How do I handle this? Well, this 2 here is going to apply to the P. So I have to note that I've got two P's on the right-hand side. Now, this O, I've got O with a little 4 here, and I've also got this 2 outside of the parentheses. So in this case, I have to do 4 times 2. Okay, 4 times 2 is 8. So now let me move on to the H2O. So with the H2O here, I see that I've got H with a little 2, so I have to mark 2 right here for the H's. And I've just got 1O here, so I've got to add 1 here for the O, and 8 plus 1 equals 9. So we can see that we've got some work to do here, right? Because I've got 1CA, 6O, 5H's, and 1P on my left-hand side. And on my right-hand side, I've got 3CA's, 9O's, 2H's, and 2P's. So all of these numbers have to match to get the question right. So 
one thing I'm going to do is I am going to start with the CAs, all right? And I'm just picking the CAs to start with here. It's not the only way you could start this. But since I've got three CAs on the right-hand side, let me stick a three right here and let's see how this changes things. Okay, so let me cross this one out because we've got to now take stock of what we've got. So I put three in front of the CA. So I now have three CAs on the left-hand side. But I now have to apply this three to the O and to the H of CaOH2. All right, so let me come back here, get rid of that two. And I'm also going to get rid of the six because those numbers are about to change. Okay, so let's apply the three here. So we know that I've got two O's already. So I've got to do two times three. Two times three is six. Okay, so this is going to become 10 oxygens on my left-hand side. Because this four is not this, these four oxygens in the H3PO4 are not going to change. Okay, let me get rid of this two. Let me get rid of this five. Okay, so let's do the same thing with the H. So before I put this three here, I had two H's. Then I put this three here, so I have to do three times two, which is six. Okay, so six plus three is nine. So now what I've accomplished is that I've matched, I've balanced up the threes, okay? I've balanced up the threes, but we're still not out of the clear yet, okay? So the next thing that I can do here is let me go after the P's, all right? I've got two P's right here on the right-hand side and one on the left-hand side. So if I put a two right here in front of the H3PO4, what that's going to do is that's going to balance up my P's. All right, but it's going to it's going to mess some other things up here. All right. So let's see what that changes. So in terms of the oxygens now, clear this out of the road here. Let's take stock of what's changed now. So I had from the H3PO4 I had four oxygens, but now I have this two here. So I have to do 2 times 4 which is 8. Okay. And now, how do the hydrogens change? Well, I now have six hydrogens on this side because I've got two times three, which gives me six. Okay, so things are, are going to be a bit different here now. All right. So six plus six is 12. Six plus eight is, what, 14? Okay, so the P's are balanced, the C's are balanced, but I've now have, I've got to modify, uh, I've got to make another change here. So let me go here to this H2O and let me stick a six out here. All right, and let's see what happens if I put a six out here. Okay, so if I put a six out here, what does that change? Hmm, so as far as my H's, all right, I have to do six times two. So what is six times two? Okay, six times two is 12. So my H's are now balanced up. So let me now take stock of what's changed with the oxygen. So now, instead of this one oxygen from the H2O, it's now six H2O. So what is six times one? Six times one is just six. So I've got to plug a six in here, all right? And so eight plus six is what? Eight plus six is 14. Okay, so now everything's balanced up. So the right answer should have been three CaOH2 plus two H3PO4, uh, yield CA3PO42 plus 6H2O. Note that I have a video on balancing where we start with the basics, start with really simple basic stuff and work our way up. If you had trouble with this problem, then it wouldn't hurt to brush up on the basics and come back and try it again.